It's 8 p.m. here on East Coast. Let's start the webinar and the recording has started too. Um, well, hello everyone. Um, what an exciting day we have today. It's April, marking the celebration of the Adrenal Diseases Awareness Month. And today, April 8th, holds special significance as it is designated as Cushing's Awareness Day. And adding to the excitement, many states in the US experienced a total solar eclipse right in the middle of the day. Here in Central Florida, I had the privilege of witnessing a partial eclipse with nearly 60% of the sun obscured by the moon. It was beautiful and serene. And now we are gathered here for an educational webinar organized by the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons. I'm Kalina Warren, representing the National Adrenal Diseases Foundation. On behalf of NADF, I extend our heartfelt gratitude to AAES for uh, spearheading this event in collaboration with our organization. Without further ado, let me pass the microphone to our moderators. It's Dr. Jenny Palorosen, endocrine surgeon at Georgetown University, and Dr. Mohamed Sidani, endocrine surgeon at Texas Tech University. Welcome. I'm Jennifer Rosen. I'm the chief of endocrine surgery at MedStar Georgetown and Washington Hospital Center. And I'm really pleased to be here on behalf of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons and um, at the uh, National Adrenal Diseases Foundation's invitation. Um, I am uh, just gonna set a couple ground rules and pass it over to Dr. Sidani. This webinar is for you. We love asking questions. We love hearing patient stories. Please put some of your questions in the Q&A. We'll try and cover an awful lot of uh, ground today. You can't cover anything and every one of our panelists could speak on their own for hours, I'm sure. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sidani, and then we'll get started with having the panelists introduce themselves. Thanks, Dr. Rosen. Hi, this is uh, Mo Sidani. I'm an endocrine surgeon in West Texas in uh, Lubbock, um, and I'm really happy to be here and uh, really happy to help as many people as possible with this really uh, interesting topic. Um, for everybody, a lot of the information that we're going to be getting is accessible through AES. Um, through our website, there's a lot of patient uh, information on that website, but also there's the new adrenal uh, adrenalectomy guidelines that AES released um, not too long ago uh, that are also um, a source of information that we're going to be using today as well. Okay, so should we get started? Okay, so... Um, we're going to start off with our first kind of a question to open up um, the topic of adrenal. And I'm hoping that uh, my the, the panelists can introduce themselves first and uh, uh, let us know about uh, where they're uh, coming from. And then we can start off with the first questions. Dr. Yip, if you could introduce yourself. Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Lynn Yip. I am an endocrine surgeon at uh, University of Pittsburgh. And uh, we were lucky to see a near totality of the uh, eclipse today, which is really exciting. Um, but I'm very honored to be here and happy to um, provide any information I possibly can for um, people with adrenal disease diseases. Thank you. Dr. Cardenas. Hi, good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, my name is Stanley. I think you're muted. Dr. You're muted, Dr. Cardenas. Can you hear me now? You're no longer eclipsed, yes. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Stanley Chen Cardenas. Uh, I'm an endocrinologist with focus on adrenal disorders uh, at Johns Hopkins University. And I'm very happy to be here. It's a great pleasure and happy to help any patients that have any questions in our webinar. Thank you. Dr. Lee. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm James Lee. I'm the chief of endocrine surgery and the uh, surgical director of the Adrenal Center at Columbia University in New York City. So uh, thanks so much for having me and uh, looking forward to chatting. And finally, Dr. Gibson. Hello. So I'm sorry, I'm having some trouble with my video. I'm working on it, but I am uh, Courtney Gibson, endocrine surgeon at uh, Yale uh, University and the fellowship director for our fellowship program. So very happy to be here this evening. 
Wonderful. So we're going to take some of the questions that you've submitted, and Dr. Sidani is going to get us started. Please, any questions you have, put in the Q&A, and then he and I will uh, I'll alternate back and forth to try and answer your questions and get some insight from our panelists. So Dr. Sidani. All righty. So uh, our first question um, is um, for the panelists. Uh, Dr. Yip, if we can start with you, can you tell us a little bit about what are some of the uh, signs and symptoms that uh, patients can present with when they have um, Cushing syndrome or MACS and what's the difference between both of those? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, so to just define the two, so Cushing's is um, where there is what we consider frank um, elevations in uh, cortisol levels. So patients have uh, very high levels, usually their um, pituitary uh, secretion of ACTH is suppressed at the same time. Um, and so they can have often some of the more, I guess, severe manifestations associated with elevated cortisol levels. On the other hand, um, MACS or mild autonomous cortisol hypersecretion is, um, as it says, it's more mild. Um, and so it's not always picked up by conventional testing. I think that's the important point is that if you do the normal, like classic 24 hour year and uh, cortisol levels, it's not always picked up on those kind of tests. Or, um, and so we often have to do very highly sensitive tests, such as a one milligram overnight dexamethasone suppression test in order to pick up um, MACS. Um, and so the symptoms um, can vary. So with Cushing's, you see more severe symptoms like, um, I guess it, it really can affect people from head to toe um, in terms of the way they look, the way they feel, um, psychological symptoms, aches, pains, weight gain. I guess, I think it, I don't think there's any part of the body that it doesn't sort of affect. Um, so it can be very debilitating and rather uh, profound. Um, and it can also uh, exist for many years before people realize it. I think it's the, the symptoms are a little bit insidious and so they, they can build up and people don't really realize that that's what's going on. Um, so it can be sometimes challenging to diagnose. Um, with MACS, um, by definition, it should be a bit more mild, and some of the symptoms can be a bit more vague, um, a bit of fatigue, a little bit of achiness, but I think really we start to think about uh, being a bit more aggressive from a from a, a treatment standpoint when people have things like hypertension, uh, diabetes, um, weight uh, things, uh, sort of, uh, um, and osteoporosis, so things that you would classically consider as part of a metabolic syndrome type of a picture. Thank you. Um, Dr. Chen, can you um, um, tell us a little bit about what are some of the uh, common and maybe a little bit less common signs and symptoms that patient with a pheochromocytoma can have? And just for everybody, pheochromocytoma is an adrenal mass that produces an excess amount of catecholamines like epinephrine, adrenaline, and many of uh, hormones similar to that. Uh, if you can tell us a little bit more about that, please. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So pheochromocytoma as well explained by Dr. Sidani, is, uh, is typically um, excess of adrenaline or these hormones that are, have to do with the, the st stress response in addition to, to different from cortisol. And typically, and or classically, we, we, we describe pheochromocytoma as characterized by headaches, sweating, and diaphoresis, or diaphoresis, which is a medical term, and palpitations or tachycardia can be present. However, pheochromocytoma can present in many different ways. And the, these three typical manifestations are not always present, and it depends on multiple, multiple reasons. Um, others, su such as hypertension, for instance, can be paroxysmal or can be present for periods of time, and then pressure, blood pressure can become normal or can be sustained. So there's a lot of variabilities in terms of the way pheochromocytoma can present, and mm, Often there are no symptoms and often we're uh, diagnosing pheochromocytoma just based on an imaging, a CAT scan that was done for a different reason. And that's how we catch actually a mass that looks like a pheochromocytoma. So other very non-specific non symptoms can be weakness or panic attacks or anxiety. And um, people, it takes time for people to realize that this could be a, it could be symptoms or manifestations of pheochromocytomas. There are also um, metabolic components of pheochromocytoma, new onset of diabetes. It's something that we, we can see in patients with pheochromocytoma. Um, this lipidemia in some patients can be seen as well. So it can be highly variable, but um, headaches, 
sweating and tachycardia is a typical uh, textbook kind of uh, triad that, that we uh, usually tell. And also depends on different uh, kind of um, hormones that are produced or different underlying mutations that are associated with this uh, syndrome. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lee, can you um, tell us a little bit about what are some of the common presentations of a patient who's uh, experiencing or uh, going through primary hyperaldosteronism, which essentially is an adrenal mass that's producing an excessive amount of aldosterone? Yeah, thanks uh, for that uh, question. So yeah, great question. So, you know, just going from, I guess, less common to the more common presentation. So, um, you know, certainly hypokalemia, low potassium levels uh, in the setting of high blood pressure can trigger uh, an astute clinician to kind of pick up on the fact that someone might have an aldosterone producing tumor because um, you can get a pretty profound hypokalemia, low potassium levels. As uh, Dr. Karnanis uh, mentioned, um, sometimes you only find patients uh, uh, or discover that a patient has a aldosterone producing tumor um, because of an incidental finding on another imaging test like a CT or an MRI that's a in adrenal incidentaloma. Uh, far and away, the most common way that we um, find patients to have uh, aldosterone producing tumors is um, a history of high blood pressure and usually uh, high blood pressure that's very difficult to control. Um, and so um, there are lots of uh, high blood pressure related um, uh, scenarios that should trigger an evaluation for um, hyperaldosteronism. So certainly if someone has a very high, what we call resistant hypertension, you know, above 150 or above, over 100 uh, consistently, um, people who are on uh, multiple uh, greater than three um, antihypertensive or blood pressure medica lowering medications um, and still having difficulty controlling their blood pressure. Um, uh, patients certainly with low potassium levels uh, and uh, interesting patients who have had um, uh, a strong family history of early uh, strokes or heart attacks, uh, you know, younger than 40 might be a, a indicator. And then certainly patients who have um, first degree relatives uh, or family members who have a history of primary hyperaldosteronism because there are some unusual or uncommon uh, inherited forms of aldosteronism. Um, and Dr. Lee, just to uh, ask you one more question. So can you comment a little bit about um, the potential role for screening for hyperaldosteronism in patients that have both hypertension and sleep apnea a little bit? Yeah, so I mean, there's some emerging data to say that um, patients who have periods where um, they stop breathing during um, uh, during sleep, uh, called sleep apnea, um, there may be an association between high blood um, hyperaldosteronism and sleep apnea. And so that also is a, a good indication that someone needs to be screened if they have uh, high blood pressure and um, sleep apnea. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that, like you guys were saying, you have to have a really low level of suspicion for stuff like that to be able to be diagnosed. And um, it kind of comes really uh, in handy to have uh, easy access to an expert that can really have that low index of suspicion when you have symptoms that can be that vague sometimes to be pinpointed to just one organ. Okay, um, I'll turn it back to, to Dr. Rosen for uh, the rest of this conversation for now. Great. Well, thank you for that introduction. I've been moderating some Q&A and I'm starting to see some questions we're going to try and get to later, specifically around Addison's and post-operative issues. But before we move on to that, Dr. Gibson, um, a couple of questions about um, can you have co-secretion? Can people's tumors make more than one hormone? And then this is going to get to our next major question, which is how do you know and how do you work up patients with adrenal tumors? Uh, that is a very uh, good question, and uh, it's a complex workup, so it really needs to be in the hands of uh, an experienced uh, physician who's uh, comfortable with working up adrenal tumors. The adrenal gland secretes so many different hormones, and so any given hormone can be secreted in excess, and also some of the hormone secretion happens in a kind of diurnal uh phase or, or manner, so the timing of testing is important as well, but to answer your first question, yes, uh, you can uh, you can have co-secretion or secretion of more than one hormone in excess. Whenever that does happen, that always raises our concern that maybe there is a primary uh, cancer of the adrenal uh, going on called an adrenal cortical carcinoma. Those are usually very large tumors with local invasion, where I believe we're going to discuss that further, a little bit uh, further in, into the discussion. But whenever there's more than one hormone being over-secreted, 
uh, that always should raise some alarms that there could be an adrenal cortical carcinoma that's present. Typically, um, if you have something like hypercortisolism, you just have cortisol excess. If you have primary uh, aldosteronism, the aldosterone levels are solely elevated, but can you have um, some cross-reactivity or some co-secretion, I'm sorry, is a better term. Yes, you can. Um, there are many different tests that you that patients have to undergo. So just checking a blood or serum level of an, a hormone like aldosterone or cortisol, that's kind of step one. It's a uh, kind of test to check for some sensitivity to see is there potentially some oversecretion, but then you're going to need to follow that up with some confirmatory testing. Um, and that can involve urine testing, uh, salivary testing, depending on what hormones you're looking after. Also, it matters what, what medications patients are taking because that can uh, impact the uh, results of testing and can sway it either to a false negative or a false positive. So it can become very complex. Uh, and so that's why it's very important to have that hormonal workup done in the hands of an experienced clinician. Thank you. Um, it certainly sounds complex. Um, and I, I think that's one of the highlights of what we're getting at here is often people will come to us having partial or incomplete evaluation. Patients can be very frustrated at how long it can take to work up um, and be absolutely certain that they've got the right diagnosis. Um, Dr. Yip, following up on uh, what you were talking about earlier with regards to Cushing syndrome, can you tell us a little bit about some key points in being certain somebody has Cushing syndrome and how we work them up? Um, so we usually start with um, some baseline blood work. Um, so typically when I see patients, they often are sent to see us with a known adrenal mass. So obviously our beginning uh, point is a little bit different than perhaps when patients go to see Dr. Cadenas. Um, and so I think when we know that there's an, an adrenal mass and our, our primary concern is whether this adrenal is potentially secreting extra hormone, the first thing that I do is to look at the imaging, make sure that the other adrenal looks okay. And I think that can really often be very helpful to sort out if I'm looking for something that's affecting um, just one adrenal versus potentially something that's affecting both. Um, and then often get some baseline blood work, um, such as uh, electrolytes, uh, make sure kidney function is okay, um, make sure that the pituitary access is okay, uh, usually with an ACTH. And then I usually will go directly and the DHEAS as well. Um, and then often we'll go next to a one milligram overnight dexamethasone suppression. Now there's lots of ways to do that. There's not only one right way to do that. Some people will do a 24 hour urine um, study to start with. Some people will do a midnight salivary cortisol. Some of these are confirmatory tests for other things. I think it doesn't really matter what you do first. It's just that just as we talked about before, just being consistent about the way that you evaluate these adrenal masses and make sure that you um, really rule out any possible uh, source of uh, uh, any of uh, that it potentially could be uh, secreting extra cortisol. And it leads into what's going to be a question later on about the complexity of managing people after surgery for Cushing syndrome. So yeah. um, I'm going to skip Dr. Cardenas for just one minute because we got plenty of questions for you a little bit later on. Dr. Lee, tell us a little bit more about the evaluation of patients who we think have primary aldosteronism. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think as the other panelists were alluding to, um, when you are dealing with uh, hormonal diseases, um, the key thing is to never just go on one value. So, you know, there's oftentimes value in repeating um, tests just to make sure that you truly do have a biochemical diagnosis. Um, uh, and so when we say patients who might have hyperaldosteronism, you know, the first thing that we do is, um, you know, after we do a thorough history and physical exam, we um, look at some blood levels. So um, the aldosterone level should be high. Usually you want to see uh, the aldosterone level, you know, above 15 or 20, depending on the lab that's doing the assays. But more importantly, uh, the renin level should be suppressed. So it should be below uh, the, um, the normal uh, lower end of the uh, normal range. Uh, and uh, oftentimes uh, at the uh, uh, lowest detection levels in the lab. Um, so once you have seen a, a patient who has a high aldosterone, a, a low or suppressed renin level, um, there's some question as to whether or not you need to do confirmatory testing or um, uh, provocative testing. So what they call saline loading or salt loading tests, where you uh, give patients a salt load and then recheck the levels. 
Um, you know, frankly, if you look at uh, most people in America with a 24-hour urine, um, uh, excuse me, 24-hour urine iodine, uh, oftentimes we are at baseline uh, salt suppressed. So um, uh, oftentimes we actually don't even need to do that test. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the mainstay of the, of the diagnosis is aldosterone and renin. So um, is there a situation, Dr. Lee, in which patients have overproduction from both sides of aldosterone, but we still are thinking about surgery in them, or where somebody had a failed first operation and still has persistence? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So um, once you've made a diagnosis of hyperaldosteronism, the next task is to figure out if uh, it's one adrenal gland or both adrenal glands that are making um, too much aldosterone. And um, that's usually lumped into the category of unilateral versus bilateral. Uh, unilateral is one side, bilateral is both sides. So um, typically, once we've made that diagnosis, um, you know, we look at the imaging tests, and oftentimes patients will have a very clear um, adenoma or nodule in the adrenal gland that makes us suspicious that they have um, hyperaldosteronism being caused uh, by one-sided uh, adrenal disease. But what we know is that if you use the imaging tests um, alone to guide your uh, decision on which uh, therapy to pursue, medical versus surgical, that uh, you're going to be wrong about 20% of the time. So um, uh, typically, once we have made the diagnosis and we've seen the imaging, we'll send patients for what we call adrenal venous sampling, which is when we, uh, our uh, colleagues, take a catheter, put it right into the veins that drain the adrenal glands, and we measure the aldosterone and the cortisol levels from both sides to try and figure out um, which side truly is hypersecreting. Thank you. These are great questions. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Sidani. All right. Um... Thank you so much. So um, one of the most popular uh, questions uh, that we uh, that we got from uh, everybody um, was what would be the best way for a patient to find and reach a physician and what would be the best way to communicate with them effectively what is happening um, to be able to kind of get the, the best help possible. Um, so I would like to, to open it up to uh, Dr. Yip to kind of uh, share with us what are some of the uh, strategies patients can find, experts in the field, both in the uh, for, as endocrine surgeons and for endocrinologists, um, and Dr. Chen can also chime in um, to be able to provide that help as adequately as possible. Yeah, so, um, so from an endocrine surgery standpoint, the AAES does have a surgeon finder on their website, so that's one way to find an endocrine surgeon. Um, I think, you know, we have a little bit of a unique perspective in that we um, are uh, trained to evaluate uh, hormonal abnormalities in addition to operate on them. And so it's, uh, it's a little bit of a different specialty. Um, obviously, we're not uh, we're not perfect. And so we rely on people like Dr. Cardenas to help us, of course, um, if there's uh, things that are that are not straightforward. Um, but uh, that's one way. The other way, of course, is to talk to your primary care physician or talk to friends and see what kind of doctors um, they have had that they uh, uh, that they um, have had a good rapport with or who have seemed like they've been um, responsive. And that's another way to, to potentially find another physician. Um, but I think really... Um, uh, uh, hopefully, um, you, you can find someone, you know, through, through your, the doctors that you know, that you have already had good uh, relationships with to try to find somebody that can help you. And, um, uh, the AES, um, surgeons finder actually, uh, it, uh, helps you find somebody within your location, um, as well. So it kind of, um, helps you narrow down whether somebody within your close vicinity has those expertise or if some, something has to be, um, found elsewhere. Um, and, uh, Dr. Cardenas, can you tell us a little bit what would be the best way to patients, uh, find help from, a, an adrenal specific or an adrenal expert endocrinologist? Yes, uh, thank you. That's a great question. So I think that it, it is important to look for uh, an adrenal-focused endocrinologist. As all my colleague surgeons have alluded, there is a lot of complex diagnostic tests that has to be done and interpreted correctly in the setting of the right medicines or interference with some of the hormones. So uh, I frequently tell patients that there may be lots of testing. Don't, don't be frustrated because sometimes we, we, we don't catch it on time. Uh, there are multiple variations of the disease and it could be very frustrating. There is a mass and we cannot find what's producing it or if it's producing or there are symptoms are not, not consistent what we would expect. 
So it, it is important to find someone who understand and the, all the testing and the workup. So one way to find is to look for adrenal centers. Um, that's that's all that usually are multidisciplinary groups that in, involve surgeons, radiologists, and uh, clinicians, endocrinologists. So those are good places to to go. And um, through their primary care physician or their general endocrinologist, they can reach out to these uh, centers or directly many of the centers can be directly reached by, by patients. Um, Dr. Lee, uh, from your uh, interactions with patients over the years, have you uh, found a, a way that um, uh, patients can um, kind of filter through these uh, many symptoms that can happen and try to maybe put them uh, in, a, in a fashion that would be easy to present or I guess uh, effective to present so that we can provide the best help we can, whether that is by writing them down or maybe uh, structuring them in a specific way? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's a great question. So, you know, I, uh, you know, talking about resources available to patients. So, you know, there's some very high quality resources. So, for example, the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons um, has a patient uh, education website where you can uh, do some research about all of the different diseases that uh, may affect the adrenal glands. Um, I think that, um, you know, the the uh, as the other panelists alluded to, you know, one of the uh, probably the most critical thing for getting an efficient, timely workup is to find expertise, right? So whether it's an adrenal center, an AES uh, surgeon, an uh, endocrinologist, a uh, primary care physician who just happens to um, have particular expertise, it's less about the specialty and more about, you know, the um, the accumulated wisdom or expertise of that practitioner. Um, and then I think once you find that practitioner, you know, it's really sort of up to them to kind of take your records and um, absorb uh, all the information in there and sort of help you make sense out of them. Um, the critical thing, I think, for us when we evaluate patients in our um, adrenal center or our uh, adrenal uh, incidental home screening clinic is to have the records, right? So, you know, like that's the first part of the battle is to get all of the imaging studies, all of the blood tests, urine tests that you may have uh, had previously. Um, and then typically what we can do is actually screen those records before your visit. And so that, that way, when you come to the visit, you know, we can talk about them or we can even order additional things prior. So that way we can make the visit as efficient as possible. So I think, you know, finding expertise, getting uh, all of your records over in a timely fashion is probably the, the most helpful uh, in, in getting you efficient uh, evaluations. And I see, I think Dr. Gibson has something she, uh, she wants to add to that. Thank you for that. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, because sometimes it could, this could be very overwhelming for uh, primary care physicians who may have a suspicion that something's going on, but they're not sure about the workup, or for patients who feel like something is wrong um, and they, you know, maybe their primary care or their referring providers didn't get all of the information over, all the imaging, all of the blood work. It's important to share how you're feeling, discuss all of your symptoms because there's no symptom that is too insignificant or subtle. A lot of these symptoms that patients have like fatigue and headaches, they're very general symptoms, but in the setting of hormonal excess and when you're talking with an expert, they will know not to necessarily overlook that thing. You know, you may have feel like periodically you have palpitations and you've been told you had a heart murmur that's insignificant, but if we hear that you have some palpitations and there is a concern that there's some hormonal excess, that um, can go a long way in helping us get to that diagnosis and get the answers and the help that you need. So there's no symptom that's too small. There's no medication that's too insignificant. You may be taking some, um, you know, uh, over-the-counter medication that could be contributing to your symptoms or could be impacting any future testing or some testing you've already had done. So I think the best thing is just to share all the information that you have and be confident that your provider, um, the expert that you're seeing is going to help you sort those things out. You don't have to have it all figured out yourself as the patient. And uh, Dr. Gibson, just one last uh, point. Uh, um, do you, Whenever patients come to you with uh, labs uh, that they've done previously with uh, at another institution or facility, uh, can you emphasize on the importance of telling um, the physician um, whether that lab was done after, for example, they received dexamethasone or if it was done at a specific time of the day um, or uh, if there was any other medication that they were taking that interferes um, with those labs that, that could have, that could con confound those, those labs? Yes, and I think that's a point of frustration for both um, the uh, providers and for the patients. You know, no one wants to have to repeat uh, testing, um, you know, it, it becomes expensive. It uh, could be very laborious, especially if you're having to do 24-hour urine samples. And so I think that um, the importance is if your um, 
physician who's starting to work things up is not an expert and they're unsure of, you know, how to perform the workup, it's best that they don't send you for all of these um, extensive tests because they do have to be done a certain way. So for example, if we're concerned about a pheochromocytoma, we want to be sure that you haven't been eating or drinking uh, too much caffeine containing substances, right? Because that can have an impact. If you uh, we're told to collect 24 hour urine sample because we're gonna be checking some of your urine for hormones. It's important that there's an adequate volume of that urine um, because it's gonna be an inadequate uh, specimen or sample if we don't have enough volume um, and also the way to store it and those type of things. So all of these um, little subtleties that uh, experienced clinicians know what to tell you to do. Um, there may be some physicians who don't know. Um, and so I think it's best if I receive lab work, one, I can tell when there's someone who's experienced who's done it because usually they have some sort of commentary in their notes that how this was done. You know, we confirmed that the dexamethasone was given the night before because we checked the, the levels along with the cortisol the following morning, or we advised the patient to abstain from X, Y, and Z or these medications and, and plan for getting this testing done. Whereas you may just see some random, a cortisol level checked on one day, uh, a uh, aldosterone level checked a week later, and that seems kind of sporadic. And so when you get those type of workups, they are going to be inconsistent and there's likely going to need to be some repeat. So what you all can do as patients, something that will be helpful is that the first uh, doctor that you present to, if they suspect uh, hormonal excess, um, you know, just ask what their level of experience is and knowing how to work that up. You know, do you, you know, do you routinely work this up and it, will I be able to get all the testing done, you know, within the, a, a certain time frame? And if there's some hesitation or some concern, um, the best thing is to be, you know, ask to be referred to someone who regularly handles um, adrenal hormonal excess, usually an experienced endocrinologist. And, and as we learned earlier, not every endocrinologist specializes in the workup of, um, uh, uh, adrenal hormones. So you really want want an endocrinologist who specializes in the workup of adrenal hormones, just like you want uh, an, an endocrine surgeon who does a lot of uh, adrenal surgery if it comes time or if, if it becomes evident that that's what you're going to need. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. Dr. Rosen. Great. So one of the things I'm hearing from a lot of the panelists, and one of the things that's really important for the patients to hear is you're also in charge of your own health. You need to keep notes. You need to know what you had done, what medications you're on, what non-prescribed uh, um, herbs or supplements you're using. Keep a diary. Keep your information down. Know every test that you've had done, when it was done. Um, and now we're going to get into a, a really interesting area uh, of questions. Many questions on the chat around this. Um, so let's say you've had your adrenal surgery for Cushing's and now you're adrenally insufficient. Let's talk about what's really an art, not a science necessarily, but the art of understanding how to manage patients after surgery. And um, I'm going to ask Dr. Cardenas to tell me a little bit about right after surgery, how do we think about supplementing patients who have had surgery for Cushing's syndrome? Great topic. Um, and as you said, it's, it's, it's a, been a little bit of an art and it, it's two different, I would say there are two different groups. And what we should understand is that the degree of cortisol elevation prior to surgery and the duration will determine how long the HPA axis, meaning the pituitary and the hypothalamus would remain suppressed after the procedure. So in many patients, they have a very fast recovery period and they many of them transiently for just a few days or weeks would require glucocorticoid replacement, but some others, it would be a long period of month and in some years, and it could be very frustrating. So the first thing that I like to do this with patients is to set expectations. So before things get better in overt cushing, things are going to get worse. So they're going to feel very fatigued, very, very tired. And I, I tell them in a good, that's in a way, that's a good thing that it meaning it means that the surgeon was able to cure you, and we took off. The, we resolved the cortisol excess, and then um, as your own systems start to take over, you're going to feel better. But during that period of time, we would like to avoid as much as possible those symptoms. And what we do is to treat them with steroids, and we provide 
a dose that is not not too low that we call replacement is a little higher because the, the, the patient's body is used to higher levels of cortisol for so long that now when you normalize their levels or if they are low, they're gonna feel symptoms of adrenal insufficiency when they're actually not. So it is really uh, a slow process that is very individual. We tend to recommend at least no less than 30 to 40 milligrams in a day for those patients that have overt cushions. In those that have a mild autonomous cortisol excess, it's, we tend to offer replacement dose for those that do not have a strong enough cortisol level after the procedure. And then over the following weeks, three, these three to four weeks, we can reassess the HP axis, checking a morning blood test of cortisol, and we decide if we need to decrease the dose or even stop the, the medicine. So, but Dr. Cardenas, how do you know? what? How do you interpret those tests and know whether the patient's going to be able to have their dose reduced or not? Yep. So, so what we do first, we look at the patient clinically. When patients are feeling better, are they improving? Many of them uh, improve very quickly over the following months. And we do a morning cortisol. And if these patients are on hydrocortisone, we ask them to, to hold the morning dose and sometimes the afternoon dose, so they have enough time so that we, we're testing the actual endogenous or cortisol levels and not testing the hydrocortisol, which can be interfered with the testing. And then we get a morning sample. So if the morning sample is higher than a certain level that we 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 can say 10, 12, depending on the assay, um, 13, um, we can say that patients are most likely to be do well without medicine. So we do both the clinical and we do the morning blood test. Dr. Yip, you're shaking your head. Yes. So tell us a little bit about how you manage the patients and um, who are, are post-operative um, from, let's just start with the unilateral one adrenal gland removed. Yeah. So I think it depends on their diagnosis going into surgery. So um, I assume that we're still talking about Cushing's. Um, if they had, um, max, M-A-C-S, then um, about 60% of those patients um, may uh, do fine without needing replacement. And so I think it's important to check them in the morning after the surgery. Um, it's important for us to tell uh, anesthesia loves to give steroids during surgery, so we have to really make sure they don't give it during the procedure and then be able to check some provocative testing in the morning to make sure that everything um, is working okay. If it's not, then um, we uh, put them on steroids. Um, for patients who have frank Cushing's, um, they will need steroids. Um, and so we usually will start them uh, right away after the operation. Um, but generally, I think it's, um, it, it's absolutely, I completely agree. It's an art. Um, and I think for patients who have Cushing's, it can be very challenging. They've been, they've been dependent on high doses of steroids for a very long time. And so what we give one person may not be enough for another person. And so I think it really is important. Um, and just, we've talked about it before, but to really be let your doctors know what you're feeling, how, how, if it's different, if it's not, if it's not enough, you have to be, uh, feel comfortable talking to your doctors to let them know that uh, whether or not you, you think that it's not the right amount of medication, so. Dr. Lee, a follow-up for that. Is it possible to have the numbers look good, <laughs> but you don't feel well as a patient? And how do you as a doctor manage that and reconcile that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, so uh, the short answer is yes. I mean, so, you know, we sort of use um, sort of the blood tests uh, as a um, sort of a screening tool, uh, you know, as sort of like the first pass of it. But, um, you know, I think as Dr. Gip was saying, you know, you, uh, for our patients, you know, you have to be your best advocate. So, you know, just because the numbers look okay, um, if you're not feeling right, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything, is, I mean, that typically indicates that there's something maybe uh, a little bit more to the story. You know, fortunately, we have uh, experts like Dr. Cardenas uh, at our center, uh, Adrenal Center at Columbia. So uh, typically, if it um, uh, seems like a more challenging case, we get our multidisciplinary team uh, on board. So not just the surgeons um, involved, but really uh, our endocrinologists who have a wealth of experience, um, uh, you know, with, um, uh, with the follow-up care for these patients. So... And I'll follow that with a question for Dr. Gibson, which is not all patients are going to be able to travel far enough to see somebody at a real adrenal center where they have expertise 
what advice would you give for patients who have had surgery and are now really struggling to manage locally um, uh, with their, their post-operative care? Um, yeah, that is a bit difficult. Um, and so, you know, there are, if, so um, just to clarify the question, so someone who has traveled remotely to have their adrenal surgery and then they don't have a local uh, person to manage or they had their su surgery done? I, I'm not clear on whether or not they had their surgery done locally, but they're just really struggling trying to find either an endocrinologist who can help manage or maybe oh. they're just too remote for too remote for someone who's really got a, a large adrenal center. What can they do? Yes. So um, I think we've talked about this a, a couple of times uh, before about some online resources. So sometimes even if you can't travel, um, there's, uh, there's a patient uh, section on our AAS website where you can get the contact information or your doctor can get that contact information to uh, reach out to an expert to get some guidance on um, you know, helping patients who are having some symptoms, either pre or post operatively. So, um, you know, we all are very open to, um, you know, sharing information, helping out uh, physicians and clinicians who may not uh, see a lot of adrenal uh, disease and, and, and know the workup or know the post operative things to look out for. But we are more than happy to uh, share that expertise. You know, um, oftentimes I think a common thing that happens uh, that is very important is that. Some patients who had Cushing's and had their surgery, no matter, sometimes they don't recognize the importance that of taking their hormone, their steroid hormone after the surgery, right? And, you know, some may say, oh, I'll get it filled in a few days. Once I get home, I'm just so glad to have the, you know, the surgery done and this is taken care of. But steroids, although in excess can be detrimental to our health, we need them um, for our health. And so if we are stressed, if you get in a car accident, if you get a cold over the weekend and you don't have enough steroids in your system, that can become an emergency uh, and it can become very life-threatening. So just having that knowledge of information, there's patient information sheets on the websites. There are uh, numbers to call where you can reach out and speak to, um, uh, get get a hold of a specialist to kind of get some guidance on that on those uh, situations when it's very difficult. And I, I think the part that you said that really resonates for me is, you know, often surgeons and physicians, we talk to each other all the time. If you've got a local endocrinologist who wants us to help them gain information and knowledge, just have them reach out to somebody um, where I, we provide counseling for other doctors and physicians and how to do the workup all the time. I think that's great. Even if you as a, a patient can't, we should be helping your physician. Dr. Cardenas had an additional point. Dr. Cardenas. Yes, thank you. I just want to make a comment. In a patient in that situation, most endocrinologists will be able to help a patient, even if, if it's not part of an adrenal center, they should reach out their local endocrinologist. And if some, most of us, when we need help from a colleague that knows more than us, uh, we will reach out to another colleague. But reaching a local endocrinologist would be the right thing to do. And the other comment that I wanted to make is that um, sometimes I see that we, it's important to give enough hydrocortisone to patients in that transition phase between the, sur the surgery and the follow-up. Because sometimes, un unfrequent, uh, unfortunately, not infrequently, uh, I see just a small amount of hydrocortisone, and sometimes patients require extra in between that period of time, and, and, and that's a little uh, risky. So, so having make sure that you get enough hydrocortisone in that period of time. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sidani. Uh, we had lots of questions about um, Addison's and adrenal insufficiency long term, but I'll let Dr. Sidani take over. Um, yeah, so uh, definitely uh, uh, the bulk of our questions are about Addison's uh, disease. Uh, so, um, Dr. Cardenas, can you uh, tell us um, a little bit more about what is um, wh what are the more most common symptoms of adrenal insufficiency? that can happen after an adrenal is removed? Um, and what would be the way somebody would know to, like if there's a difference in symptoms or presentation when somebody is on not enough steroids and somebody that is on, uh, let's say too much steroids and are having the opposite effect um, of that. Some people end up having cushionoid or cushion-like symptoms just because of the excess of that. So sometimes people wonder if the disease is coming back, but Maybe it's because it's medication induced. Can you please comment on that for us? Yeah, good question. So adrenal insufficiency uh, symptoms can be very vague and nonspecific 
from fatigue, tiredness, uh, from um, lack of appetite, um, can be simply a, a little bit of nausea. And um, that sometimes don't trigger the patients to, to, to look for help. But uh, it is important to recognize those other findings that should make patients think about uh, low blood uh, hypoglyc I mean, adrenal insufficiency is lo low blood sugar. So patients were diabetes before surgery and now are having frequent low blood sugars. Um, that's also some, some, something that should trigger the need for, for, to look for, for some help. Very low blood pressure. And as, as, the, as the adrenal insufficiency continues, uh, that could be more pronounced. So, so those are important uh, findings. Um, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, nah, that's when they are going into a crisis. That's also something to, to keep in mind. To the other question on whether the symptoms resemble, yes, the symptoms are very specific and particularly in the post-op period, it can be challenging to differentiate between the nausea af after having a surgical procedure versus with, could this be adrenal insufficiency? And I think the only way is to have a high index of suspicious. Some patients get a procedure and they get these non-specific symptoms. It's important to 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 ask to to recognize them. Um, the other um, part of the question is too much cortisol and too much hydrocortisone or too much medication. Yes, definitely will resemble um, Cushing's from before the procedure from endogenous Cushing's, and it can be associated with uh, hypertension, high blood pressure, weight gain, weight regaining weight. Um, sometimes it's fluid retention. Um, what else? That sometimes high blood sugar can be also another complication. So all those things can 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 trigger patients or physicians to say, well, maybe you are getting too much of the hydrocortisone, and perhaps it's it's time to decrease it. So anyone who's in more than twenty milligrams a day, we should think that uh, we want to lower that uh, sooner sooner as possible. As soon as possible. Yeah, I was about to ask you if there's kind of like a cutoff that you would uh, consider. Uh, some of the questions that we have in the in the, the chat, um, some people that are on cortisone or hydrocortisone after surgery, or let's say in the setting of uh, adrenal insufficiency, um, th they've been told by some physicians that they cannot be tested for their ability to produce uh, cortisol themselves while they're on our while they're on prednisone or hydrocortisone. Um, do you have a way that uh, you can advise these patients on um, how they can get tested to see if they have any endogenous production themselves? Um, and then just a follow up to this one to this question. Um, some people were asking in the chat whether there is any cardiovascular uh, symptomatology or complications to long term high dose steroid exposure, and what would that be considered high dose exposure? Yeah, that's correct. So to address the first question, it was about the, the how you test. So um, in hy hydrocortisone, it's a short acting uh, glucocorticoid, which which is an advantage because um, it allows your pituitary and hypothalamic system to recover and because you have a period of non-exposure. So what I normally tell patients that are receiving the medication in order to test their endogenous production is to first um, you test at eight between seven in the morning and nine in the morning, hold the morning dose or take the pill with you to the lab, but don't take it the morning of the test. So if your last dose of hydrocortisone was at three or four in the afternoon, then you have all that period until the next day without medicine. So that should be good enough to uh, give you an idea. Some, some other experts recommend uh, holding the afternoon dose of the prior day just to have a 24 hour period. That's also, that's also reasonable. And with that, um, you should have an idea of what is the cortisol. Um, we also get ACTH. Uh, in some cases, ACTH becomes sup above the, the superphysiologic or above the upper reference range, and that's a sign of recovery of the of the pituitary adrenal axis. And that's going to tell you that probably in the next following weeks, the patient perhaps may uh, recover his punch. So you can do that with prednisone. It's a little uh, it's a little more challenging because it's a little longer acting. It's an intermediate acting. And glucocorticoid, but um, you can still do it. And um, if you, again, hold the morning dose, you have at least a 24-hour period without being uh, exposed to prednisone. Um, with the second part of the question, um, what is the, the there, where there, whether there are cardiovascular complications associated with too much glucocorticoids? 
And the answer is is yes. Um, if you if a, if a patient takes too much uh, too too much or too too high doses, and what is a high dose? So if someone does not have adrenal function, we call replacement uh, an equivalent of fifteen to twenty milligrams of hydrocortisone in a day, or five milligrams of prednisone. So any anywhere anything above that will start to increase, you know, in proportion to the dose and the duration. So both are important, and the cumulative doses are also important. So um, if this is sustained for long periods of time, there is a higher chances of developing hypertension, cardiovascular complications, along with hyperglycemia, along with DVTs and opportunistic infections, if you go higher and higher in proportion to the dose. So definitely there's a lot of potential complications associated with, with steroid use. And Dr. Cardenas, we'll come back to you in just one second, but I was gonna ask uh, Dr. Lee, um, there's uh, some questions about whether there's a role for surgery in the management or even um, improvement of symptoms for people with Addison's disease. If you could uh, comment on whether there is a, a role for that. Oh, well, I mean, uh, I guess the, sh the short answer is probably not much of a role. I, it really kind of depends on the underlying etiology of uh, things, but, um, you know, uh, adrenal insufficiency is typically not treated by uh, surgical means. Um, and um, Dr. Cardenas, I'll come back to you. Um, one of the biggest things that we've, uh, th that uh, we're getting questions about, is there a way to prevent uh, adrenal insufficiency? Um, and are there supplements that are not necessarily steroid based that can help improve symptomatology such as brain fog and fatigue um, that, that, that people can take? The short answer is not that I'm aware of. And um, many supplements contain some amount of steroids. And if patients stop taking those, they can have, they can have their HP axis suppressed. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend having those supplementation um, as part of their daily. All right, Dr. Rosen, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Well, um, we only have a couple minutes left and we have so much to cover. You can see that just one webinar, there's just no way to be able to get all of these questions, these great questions answered. Um, we're going to have a few um, final questions and then we'd always love to come back and um, be your guests again to try and answer some more of these questions. I'm gonna do one final round and go around and ask a few questions here. So Dr. Yip, for patients who have mild autonomous cortisol excess, but aren't thought to have florid clear Cushing syndrome yet, how do doctors know when it's time to recommend surgery for them? Yeah, it's, it's a tough um, decision. And so something that I always, it's shared decision-making. And so I talk to the patient to really get a nice uh, picture of, of what's bothering them um, and what truly, uh, why they're there, what kind of symptoms are they having, um, what sorts of comorbidities do they have, what are, they, are they having difficulty managing their blood pressure, is their diabetes difficult to control, do they have osteoporosis, or is it a little bit of everything? And then I also look at um, sort of their overall health, are they good candidates for surgery, are they, gonna, are they going to be able to um, get through it with minimal uh, complications? And so I think we take all those into account and talk to the patient and give them the pluses and minuses. I think part of the um, issue with Max is that there's a paucity of data. We just, we need more information. We we know that people do better, but what exactly gets better? Who are the people that really improve? I think there's still a lot of questions. And certainly um, the other thing is the quality of life. So comparing pre and post and dealing with all these issues that we were talking about with post-operative um, Addison's disease and uh, adrenal insufficiency and a little like cortisol insufficiency, I guess you would also sort of call it. And how does that impact with um, ultimately quality of life? And so I think there's a lot of questions we still don't, uh, we still need to answer. Thank you. Dr. Gibson, um, when you're talking with a patient before surgery, and then you think about how you manage them after surgery, what's something how could we be helping patients more in their decision making, particularly patients who are looking at potentially having to have a bilateral adrenalectomy or more adrenal surgery in the future? What do you think are are important things for people to know? Um, I think that's a, a great question. So it is 
a very big decision for the uh, surgeon uh, the, and the patient to make when you're going to plan for a bilateral uh, adrenalectomy because you are subjecting that patient to lifelong supplementation of some sort. Um, if you do not have either adrenal gland, you're going to need some lifelong supplementation. So I, I always try and stress that fact. And just like with any surgical decision making, we always have to measure the risks and benefits to the patient. Um, you know, there are some patients who suffer very greatly from, uh, let's say, an ectopic source of uh, cortisol. It's not found in the adrenals. You can't find it in the pituitary. You look everywhere and you can't find it. And so sometimes a last resort is to um, perform adrenalectomy um, as, you know, removing the end organ uh, problem in that manner. But again, move, removing both adrenal glands is a very big decision. And it's usually in the setting of you've exhausted all other options uh, and, and, and this patient has debilitating disease. We all suffer from fatigue, you know, weight gain. You know, some of us have some hypertension that's a little difficult to control. But in the grand scheme of things, subtle uh, symptoms like that, to me, in my opinion, is not worth performing a bilateral adrenalectomy in. Now, you know, if people have very debilitating disease where, you know, they're so weak that it's affecting their quality of life, they're unable to work. Um, this is the, the degree of symptomatology that we're talking about when we're considering a bilateral adrenalectomy. Um, and just um, counseling patients about the recovery time, too. You know, you're not just going to spring back after, you know, a few days post-op when you have that um, done. And your, um, your body's going to have to adjust to the hormonal supplementation that you're now going to need every day. And so you sometimes you may feel a little bit worse um, before you feel better. So you may feel a little bit worse than you did even before the surgery. Um, but the ultimate goal is with proper decision making, you should feel better in time. So I think it's just a shared decision making. You want to have all the information that you can as the patient. And so you want to have an experienced clinician helping you to make those decisions and also discussing what potential benefit, you know, is this going to significantly impact your, let's say, hypertension or your fatigue or your muscle weakness? Um, or is it going to maybe improve your blood glucose levels, but maybe it's not something that you feel so, so strongly? So those are important questions you want to ask. How am I going to feel after both of my adrenal glands are gone and for how long? And am I going to feel better in time? So those are some important questions. And also, how many times have you performed a bilateral adrenalectomy and what are those outcomes? How have patients done over time? Do people regret, regret having undergone that? So those are all, and you're not um, insulting your surgeon or your endocrinologist by asking those questions. Those are perfectly reasonable and appropriate questions that you should be asking. That's great. That's a really thorough answer for something that patients are facing. Just a couple minutes left. Dr. Lee, any last thoughts for our um, participants? No, I mean, I think this has been a, a fantastic uh, session. So thank you all uh, uh, for organizing this. I think, you know, uh, again, just to reiterate, probably the most important take home points is that, number one, there are resources out there, um, you know, the patient education website um, for, of the AAS and, um, you know, Endo Society has some uh, really good information out there as well. Um, if you think you have adrenal disease or have been diagnosed with adrenal disease, find expertise. Um, you know, the patient, excuse me, the surgeon finder can help you find local expertise, but, um, you know, your docs uh, at home should uh, have a good handle on, you know, uh, where to help you find some of that expertise. Uh, and, um, you know, sort of, as Dr. Fernandez was alluding to, um, our endocrinology colleagues are sort of the, the front line. They are the um, the best uh, uh, resource for, um, you know, especially the very tough, uh, difficult questions. So uh, I think seek out that expertise. Um, I really like how everyone tonight in many of their answers and Dr. Sidani also, um, it's clear surgeons, endocrinologists, we all think so carefully about our patients before surgery, after surgery, the long-term consequences of what it is that we do. It's It's really a lot that we think about. So um, I'm going to have to cut us short as we wrap up and turn it over to the NADF. And I really want to thank my co-moderator, Dr. Sidani, Dr. Lee, Dr. Cardenas, Dr. Yip, Dr. Gibson, all for your time and for you hosting us tonight. Well, thank you, Dr. Rosen. Thank you to all participants uh, for your time, for your knowledge that you are willing to share. Uh, this evening with patients and 
address our questions and concerns. We greatly appreciate that. And I took a note that you mentioned that maybe another webinar is needed <laughs> since there is so many questions. So I might be reaching out to you again. Thank you so much again and good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you for having night. us. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.